Hey guys, welcome back to Storytime with Dual Man Tim. No, not really, but uh, if you've been following along, I wanted to have an extra fill-in episode each week while I was on the road. Uh, 40 days, five weeks, somewhere in that ballpark, but I wanted to have five in the can just so that you would always get something. So if you've been following along and I haven't had enough content for you, I've been sliding out these history of preparedness readings. So today, if you've never heard of him before, this is Mel Tappen. He would be the grandfather of survival guns. He is definitely one of the most influential people who kind of started a base on survival guns and that sort of thing. I'm sure he kind of paved the way for a lot of the people who came afterwards that you may have trained with or we've definitely seen on YouTube. Uh, Mel was a, um, he didn't live a long life. He died in the early 80s, but he wrote this and I believe it was the, survivalist letter or survival letter, something along those lines and post hum. Yeah, anyway, I tried to say a big word there. <laughs> it didn't come out the way I wanted it to. So after his death, his wife compiled a bunch of his uh, top writings and uh, he used to write for guns and ammo and all of those plus his newsletters. And she combined them into a bunch of different books. So there's tapping on guns and tapping on survival. This is a great one. There is a chapter in here that I'm going to give you the overview of called a survival checklist. And this was written, I believe, in the late 70s, somewhere in that ballpark. So when you hear this, you'll think, wow, I wondered where everything that we know now came from. Well, 50 years ago, nearly at this point, 45 to 50 years ago, there was people like Mel Tappan. Before that, there was Kurt Saxon. Before that, there was Don Stevens and his wife, Barbie. They were... They were standing there with their shoulders that we get to stand on today. So let me share with you a little bit. Uh, there's not a lot of pictures in this book, of course. Let's see if I can do this without destroying it. But there he is writing a list or an article or something. Chapter two, survival checklist. Over the past few months, the mail has brought repeated requests for some sort of checklist that could be applied to one's personal preparedness program say that 10 times fast. The subject is obviously too complex for any such list to be comprehensive without a great deal of elaboration, specialized knowledge, and probably personal counsel. But used prudently, such an inventory could provide an overview of what I'm trying to accomplish in these columns and give those of you who are serious about preparing an outline on which you can begin to build for yourselves. The kind of disaster that you expect to occur is going to affect the way in which you adapt this outline to your personal needs. I have drawn it with a monetary collapse in mind, since the odds presently favor that event by a substantial margin. If you see nothing more than a severe inflationary recession, you may want to eliminate or reduce the emphasis on several points. On the other hand, if you foresee a nuclear confrontation as an adjunct to the economic chaos, there are several additional categories which you will need to consider. Finally, these recommendations reflect my own judgments. Your personal circumstances may well change some of your priorities, as I have set them down. If you think that you should buy some coins before you get into trade goods, we have no quarrel. I do think, however, that the first seven items on this list are priority one and should be pursued concurrently to the extent possible. Number one, you. The most important factor in the survival equation is you, your physical health and your cast of mind, particularly the way in which you handle stress. If you need minor elective surgery, get it out of the way as soon as possible and discuss with your doctor the advisability of prophylactic surgery, such as having your appendix removed. In other words, try to do things ahead of time. Be proactive. There are some serious pros and cons to be considered in that connection, and you will need competent medical advice from someone who shares or at least understands your survival concerns. You should also see an eye specialist who can assess the health of your eyes, as well as ensure that you're properly fitted with glasses if you need them. Teeth, too, should be their share of scrutiny. If you are 47 and still waiting for those last two wisdom teeth to descend, give up the hope and have them out now so that your wife won't have to do the job some evening by candlelight with a razor blade and a pair of vice grip pliers. Whew. Talking the truth there. Once you know the present state of your health, you should begin to do what you can do to improve it. Stop smoking, or at least inhaling. <laughs> this is an interesting thought here. If you inhale tobacco smoke, you now have some degree of permanent lung damage. Further, if you're hooked on tobacco or anything else, your options under survival conditions are reduced. 
adjust your weight to a sensible level. If you are more than 25 pounds over or under your ideal weight, bring it in line by adopting sensible eating habits. No fad diets, please. Just better nutrition and an adjustment of quantity. My big struggle there, guys. Everybody knows it. Discuss with your medical advisor the management of any chronic illnesses you have in detail. Buy your prescription drugs in quantity and rotate them to keep fresh supplies on hand. Once you have embarked on a program to improve your physical health, you may want to give some thought to what the current vernacular might term where your head is at, <laughs> how you react to stress, your personal hangups, the way in which you interact with other people. Next, number two, develop necessary skills. Next to physical and mental health, the most important consideration for aspiring survivalist is the development of vital skills. Make a list of what you consider the minimum number of skills that you would need to keep yourself and your family alive over a protracted period with no outside help and start learning them at once. You will need to learn quite a bit more in some of these areas than others. In the case of medical care, for example, mastering a simple first aid course will probably not be enough. In some areas, citizens are allowed if not encouraged to take courses offered for paramedics. Hunting and foraging are skills that most readers of guns and ammo probably possess to some degree, but don't neglect trapping, calling, baiting, and jacklighting, as well as other te techniques that may be illegal and unsportsmanlike now, but essential in an emergency. You will note that I have emphasized the word practical as applied to defensive shooting and unarmed combat. A hunter safety course is not equivalent to the basic training available at Jeff Cooper's Gunsight Ranch. You probably know whether you need martial arts training, but gun buffs often delude themselves about their shooting abilities, particularly their prowess as combat pistolerios. <laughs> if you're serious enough about survival to want to know the truth, let me suggest a simple but revealing test. Find a safe place to shoot without too many curious onlookers and bring a friend with you. Set up a silhouette target or simply 24 by 36 long sheet of wrapping paper at 25 yards. Then with your friend timing you and blowing a start and stop whistle on a loud five second intervals, draw your pistol of choice in a serious caliber and fire five shots at the center target mass within the allotted five seconds. Reload, repeat. If all of your shots can be contained within a 10-inch circle, four times out of five, your survival index is probably adequate. Start collecting reference materials. Books and magazine articles on practical subjects will be among your most valuable survival assets. How-to books in a variety of fields are a must. Construction, repair, farming, trapping, raising animals, cooking game, making clothing, leather, and woodworking, reloading, making tools, and the like. Be sure to include as many books as you can that emphasize the use of hand tools and similar techniques. The Foxfire books and similar volumes which offer primitive alternatives. Wow, that is pretty cool, guys. This is me talking here, not reading. But the Foxfire books, we're talking 40 to 50 years ago, were considered a reference material. And even today, they are. They, If you can get a hold of any or all of the Foxfire books, do it. They're every bit as good as the Survivor Compendium by Kirk Saxon. Probably better. In addition to expanding your range of essential skills, your survival library should also provide entertainment as well as a means of educating your children and stimulating your own intellectual growth. General reference books are also virtually indispensable. At the very least, you should have the latest World Almanac, a Webster's International Dictionary, American Heritage, or Webster's New World. A quality encyclopedia such as Britannica could be worth its weight in gold. Times have changed a little, but if you could still get your hands on them, probably wouldn't hurt. It would require several times the space we have here just to list all the books you should consider, including in your survival library. Some portion of your budget should be set aside for essential periodicals. You'll probably find a complete file of Mother Earth News helpful. Kurt Saxon's The Survivor is particularly useful for learning to improvise. He emphasizes 19th century kitchen technology, kitchen table technology. And um, there's a bunch of daily good newsletters that he was talking about back then. The Daily News Digest. The Reaper, The Remnant Review. For financial preparedness and interpretation of current events, they are all worth reading. Number four, guns and ammo. With the exception of your own skills and mental preparation, nothing is likely to be more important to your survival than your firearms. In past issues of this column, as well as in my book, Survival Guns, I have dealt with this topic at some length, so nothing more than a brief word should be necessary here. Please remember, however, that the criteria for selecting arms to be used for sporting purposes are quite different from those that pertain to choosing survival guns. Number five, food and water storage. 
Anyone who depends on public utilities for his water supply now should have, at a minimum, one week's water ration put up in containers made for the purpose or else in plastic bleach bottles together with a few drops of chlorine bleach or iodine as a preservative. Small portable water purifiers such as the water washer which employ silver ionization and activated charcoal filtering should be considered. Food storage is a fairly complicated matter and certainly one of the most vital aspects of survival preparedness. Consequently, it is best undertaken on an individual basis with the help of a knowledgeable expert. Do not, however, settle for any company's prepackaged one-year supply. Although some are certainly better than others, a few one-year supply provide only 900 to 1100 calories per day, and others are filled with cheap calories such as mashed potatoes, cornmeal, and peas. The basic program can be extended to perhaps double the man days fairly inexpensively by adding the basic four in quantity sufficient 300 pounds of hard red, red winter wheat at least 15 percent protein 100 pounds of powdered milk 100 pounds of honey and eight pounds of salt i prefer that all these items be prepared for storage by one of the better commercial firms and the milk must be for reasonable shelf life practice using storable foods in your daily menus now Later is not the time to learn either their eccentricities or the threshold of your gag reflex. Some items are delicious and others may take some getting used to, or at least some imaginative preparation. Beautiful quote there, guys. Don't forget a hand grinder for the wheat, and you may want to include some books and equipment to help preserve the food you grow and hunt for later on. Retreats. Whether you prefer, prefer to call them retreats, refuges, or havens, during having a safe place to go away from the cities during a major crisis is one of the two most important factors in a realistic program of long-term survival. Preparedness. The other is having the means of self-protection and food gathering. Number seven, tools of self-sufficient living. This category properly includes all the apparatuses or apparatuses <laughs> useful or necessary to making your way without outside help. Such obvious items as knives, axes, and other edge tools, construction and repair implements, farm and garden tools, hunting, fishing, and general outdoor gear communication devices. Number eight, alternative energy sources. Hmm. I've been hearing a lot about energy lately, guys. This topic can be of great or little concern depending on your personal retreat plans, requirements, and tastes. It may be as uncomplicated as substituting wood for whatever you now use for heating and cooking, or as complex as building a solar energy home with wind or hydroelectric power as a backup. Some will want to consider converting their cars or trucks to run on alternate fuels, while others will merely turn to bicycles or horses. 9. Trade goods. Such items such as ammo, fish hooks, knives, and needles are likely to be a much greater value for some after the collapse than any of the traditional forms of money, including gold and silver. Small, useful manufactured items such as which require heavy industrial equipment to fabricate and for which there are no easily improvised efficient substitutes should be your first choice. That is a great quote right there, guys. Rimfire ammunition is a good example. Almost everyone owns a 22, and yet there is certainly no reasonably effective kitchen table method of making ammunition for them. The time may well be near when you can exchange a handful of these useful cartridges for a cow, bushels of produce, or virtually anything else that you may need. Money. This is another of those topics that require at least a full column even to approach useful coverage. If that you sorry guys, if you feel that you must do something until the article appears, buy at least one full bag, a thousand dollar face value of U.S. silver coins dated 1964 or earlier, having no pneumastic value. These are known in the trade as common date or junk silver coins because they are not rare, but they do have the silver content and they are recognizable as money. Because of the decline in value of paper dollars, such honest money will cost you more than three times its face value. Q&A. Question. You and others have convinced me that we are headed for a total monetary collapse and a real upheaval as a result. But don't you think you carry the survival preparations a little too far? 
The head of a well-known survival newsletter says that guns will not be necessary when the collapse comes because there will not be any violence except in some big cities. He says that if we have a year's supply of food, some gold and silver coins, a home in the suburbs, and a wood stove, we will survive okay, especially if we warn our neighbors to prepare as well. I'm guessing the dude's probably selling the year's supply of food and some gold and silver coins, but anyway. When you begin to read extensively in survival literature, you will encounter a good deal of conflicting advice, and only you can make the final decision of how much to prepare, or for that matter, whether to prepare at all. None of us can do more than warn you that trouble is coming, give you our reasons for thinking so, and then, if we are skilled, suggest specific ways in which you may reduce your risks from those hazards that might logically be expected to develop as a result of the particular kind of trouble we anticipate. I prefer to believe that no one professionally engaged in giving advice on life and death matters would deliberately seek to gain popularity by handing out comforting, easy answers to the highly complex and perilous problems that disaster survival poses. But the point of view occasionally leaves me puzzled since, as you say, there are those who accept the premise that a breakdown in the social order is coming. With its attendant loss of essential services, vital food production and distribution, yet they insist that widespread violence will not occur, and some even recommend against taking steps to provide for your own protection, if it should. I earnestly hope that they are right and I am wrong, but what if the reverse proves to be true? Holocaust or not, it is utter foolishness for any adult not to own a defensive firearm and the skill to use it to protect himself and his family. Even today, no one can guarantee your safety except you. Guys, Mel Tappen, this entire book is just full of nuggets of wisdom. I don't own his Tappen on Gun Jet, but, or maybe it's called Survival Guns. I, I apologize if I got that wrong for you, but it's worth looking up. Anything written by Mel Tappen, he has a way with words. He doesn't mince his opinions. Uh, he isn't nearly as a provocateur as Kurt Saxon. He had the benefit of being in the next generation after Don Stevens. So he had those shoulders to stand on. And of course, he loved guns. What can you go wrong with? So I hope you enjoyed this look at his survival checklist. Compare it to what we talk about today, and you will discover there ain't much difference. It's kind of cool. It's neat. Uh, everybody, every generation thinks the world's going to end during their generation. I get it. For some reason, uh, I'm aware of that. Not everybody seems to be aware of it, and I don't get it. But that doesn't mean it couldn't happen. It doesn't mean we shouldn't be prudent and prepare. It just means that you need to both prepare for the end and the living in between. So guys, with that, as always, stay happy, stay healthy, and have a great week.